for having me here. It's quite a wonderful session to be here. And I've seen lots of um, interesting talk today. And um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. So, um, um, as you all got, I have also got a long name, and I put there. And uh, sometimes my title would be quite longer than, uh, my name would be quite longer than the title. That's what usually happens, but I've turned that out. Right, and um, I'm actually talking about uh, why Johnny still find usable security and privacy engineering so hard. So the Johnny could be the engineer. So, so I just try to come up with a fancy name and, uh, and rather than say an engineer. So I wanted to make sure that um, the whoever the person who's reading that work that we have already done would find it quite interesting. And when it comes to security engineering, particularly software or security engineering, people find it quite hard because attackers find it uh, humans as the weakest link in information security. And because they are always interested in identifying the human weaknesses and then design the technology to help uh, um, to protect them. So um, if you look at previous attacks, they are constantly arguing humans are the weakest link in information security. Actually, I do not like this argument, this narrative, because humans are not the weakest link in information security. As this is, humans are the weakest link in information security from the attacker's perspective. Attackers are quite keen uh, to understand um, um, how do we manipulate humans through the different attacks. So, but as a system engineers, scientists, what, what our duty, our responsibility is to understand the weakest link and turn that weakest link into a strong one that how do you do that when we design the systems we need to take human element on board um, take in human element considerations and then design and develop whatever the systems either previously our security our engineering systems that that we built on and so why do I keep why do people keep constantly talking about humans are oh, the weakest link in information security let's create a password so now what create a password that's at least six characters long with a mixture of letters and numbers so that's what we are getting from the password rules from the systems we implement we design and develop when you look at that how about one two three users find it quite the easiest way to sneak into the system, so stay away from the systems, security solutions. Oh, um, it has to be, so then the error message is going to say that it has to include at least letters um, and be at least six characters long. How about ABC? So they don't really understand the system that we design for people, they, don't, they find it quite difficult to understand or to interact with the system because the systems are not being humanly designed. So then they say letters and numbers at l and at least six characters long. What about foursome? Um, and uh, I've been told that not to use a filthy language, but sometimes. Um, uh, when it comes to the password rules, that means uppercase, lowercase, special case characters that we've got to use. But in that case, that sidetrack, that is against the usability. It is very difficult to remember these usernames and passwords, and particularly when you set up according to the password rules. So that is a quite challenging, that how do you, uh, when you engineer something, how do you balance uh, the usability perspective as well as the security perspective when it comes to design better systems? So when you come up with a password rules, and people find it quite difficult to understand, difficult to remember, so password recovery service, for moron, and I don't remember my password, is it one, two, three? How many times you have been talking to ourselves about when we try to enter our password? So because according to password rules, they say you have a 10 different website, you do have a 10, you should have 10 different passwords for that. So, but which is quite challenging, I do believe, in this case. And when it comes to that, when the users are provided with password rules and a kind of very complex systems, and then what they do is they try to easily bypass. Oh, they might say that, okay, in order to protect my company from ransomware attacks, I want to, I've decided not to open any emails for this month because human, I can't eliminate. We can't eliminate end user from the systems. So what are the things that we engineer have we thought about taking human elements? 
into consideration when it comes to designing and developing systems. Particularly, this is quite important in security and privacy aspects of perspective. So I will talk about a lot of attacks and what has happened in the past and what kind of research we investigate in in order to break into the systems uh, in Australian Defence Force Academy. So if you've been asked to use, how many of you have been using at least one of these passwords here? I've got a legitimate one answer. <laughs> yeah. And so basically in this is the statistics that I have taken from 2016, um, starting from one, two, three, four, to Star Wars, perhaps the most worst, perhaps the worst password that I've ever seen in our life, and people know about it. So you don't have to make a sophisticated attack to break into people's systems, but you could use social engineering, understanding people, understanding their behavior, and then break into the system. You don't have to have a 24-year-old, 19-year-old guy can uh, uh, hack into uh, 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 U.S. Vice Presidential candidate 2000 and back in 2008, Sarah Palin, uh, the post Yahoo account. He hasn't used complicated techniques. He just used social engineering techniques to set up his uh, uh, security questions where he could recover the password and reset the password. But Sarah didn't know about this. And she's not the technologist. She's not a technology person. She's the, just a normal average person. If the system is not being designed for people, so people, you know, attackers would be interested in breaking into the system too. So when I think about how much of, how much of security we are sacrificing for convenience, assume that when we design systems like these, set up, set a password for your account. You can use anything you like. Password, one, two, three, Star Wars, anything you like. But the problem is, this is quite usable, will that be secure? But when it comes to situations like that, we design systems and asking users to generate uh, passwords, which are quite complex and strong password. I do believe that. But in that case, we are opposing the interaction element, and this is not quite convenient for the users. And therefore, they just try to move on to a less secure but more usable system. And they might not use the system. So this is kind of a challenging thing that we have. And the people find it quite difficult to remember the password in this case. And think about, this is my desktop, actually. Think about uh, situations. I wanted to list down all files on my desktop. And this is just the only file that I've got. That's not the nicest picture, by the way. But that's my picture. Um, it's an islingosanka.jpg. And if you look at these on my console, it's got read, write, execute, all the privileges that I have got. But can a normal person understand this? Of course not. But if you provide this one, yes, we can understand that. Because we know that Nolin, we have got three accounts, Nolin, that's me, my, that's myself, and we've got a staff account. Um, our IT folks in defense can access to that bloody staff account. And uh, actually, I didn't want to do that, but there is no mechanism that I can save from that kind of stuff. But oh, the everyone has got privileges, read, write, execute. They can do it. But actually, that's a disabled one that nobody can access to that, that for the security reason. So you can even change the admin privileges when you go there. If you've got the root access, admin access, what I'm talking about. But this is easy to understand about all the file size, um, where it's been stored, and the time that they have created. All the information will be there, we know that. But think about situations, and I've created another file call here. <coughs> file.jpg and file.jpg. So raise your hands, those who believe both the files are same. Well, in file1.jpg, file1.jpg. File so the, those, those two, it looks the same. Raise your hands, those two things, those files, they look the same. So, so the, actually speaking, those files, those are two different files. So the second one is I. So the file.jpg with capital I, I've replaced that with capital I, would you be able to uh, uh, differentiate that, note the difference? You can't. This is where the attackers are interested in. And if you provide with a graphical user interface, but you can't provide the console for the normal people because they don't understand about how to use all the commands, they list out whatever the things that you wanted to type in. That's a problem that we are facing today. And attackers are, because recently we have uncovered some of the attacks, like uh, people use uh, ASCII code values to create 
the particular letters in the alphabet. So then, instead of having apple.com, because users might see that apple.com, but in the DNA, DNS, domain name systems, they have changed that through the ASCII value and where the service identifies the different domain name systems, but which is not the Apple, but it will display apple.co.uk or .com.au, whatever the things that they want to do. But that's not the proper Apple thing. So even the specialists like security experts and security professionals like uh, ourselves can't identify that. Then think about general users. Definitely can't identify these kind of things. So when you do that in, in, in the graphical user interface, this is a very basic example. People find it difficult. But if you use the, um, uh, the console applications, you can particularly identify the difference. So you see the first one is a capital I, and the second one is uh, L, which is the different thing, but which is not being able to differentiate on the, uh, on the graphical user interface. There are all different techniques people are using to fool people. So that's what we are interested in. And when we engineer the systems, we need to take all the aspects into considerations. And let's have a look at this and what's happening before talking about a lot of password things. How am I going to play this? We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a 12 Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like past years would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, 6, 12, oh, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? <laughs> no, I cannot do that. But you, we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh, my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight, and then Israel. It's it's only three, but it's you know it's uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland, <laughs> one, two, three, four. Gemma, one, two, three. Spell G E M M A. <laughs> or Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Like so what? like. Like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's um, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. Oh, yeah. He said that, okay, you know my password. Yeah. So this is the main problem that we are facing today. So that humans are susceptible for these attacks. Attackers are not using any other strategies. I mean, we know that they use different strategies as well, but it's quite cost effective to use humans to manipulate and understand the threat models and break into other people's systems because you don't have to spend a lot of time on doing that. And because people are quite emotional, quite different. They behave differently in different situations. So that's what we should understand. And taking human into consideration when it comes to designing and developing systems, which is quite, which is fundamentally important, but which is quite rather difficult task to do that. Because humans, they, different, they act differently. So we did a bit of work with, when I was in uh, uh, University of British Columbia, Canada, working with Apple, uh, uh, incorporation. We did a bit of work with Apple and they gave, they came to us and they said that, hey, look, we are interested in, um, we know that there is a problem. I mean, so basically that's why we phrased the paper not as a breach, all kind of things. So we, there is a vulnerability we just uh, demonstrated. That's it, because we are not allowed to do that. But I can speak publicly, whatever I want. But uh, on the impact of the Touch ID, the iPhone passcode, what we did, uh, we, when Apple introduced their Touch ID systems, this is the architecture they talked about it, they claim it is their Touch ID is secure and usable. We did agree with the usability bit, but we did not agree with the security bit. This is what, how the architecture described, demonstrates how the technology works. So when you use Touch ID, <coughs> initially, when you buy them off the shelf, or when you reboot your machine every time, uh, mobile device or anything that you've got the Touch ID sensor, uh, the fingerprint sensor, Touch ID, that's the same thing, and you've been asked to use a 
passcode, which is the stronger version of the PIN, uppercase, lowercase, special case characters, uh, and so on and so forth. But if you've been asked to do that, uh, which is quite difficult because the frequency of unlocking your mobile device is quite high, and that is a massive problem because every time you've got to unlock your mobile device, you don't want to put eight digits or 10 digit passcode. So what they did with, they introduced when you boot up your machines and when you buy them off the shelf, and you can first time, very first time, you can configure your Touch ID system, the PIN or the passcode, instead of using PIN, together with your thumb. So the thumb is the usability bit, but Touch ID is the security bit. As long as you use a stronger version of the thumb that is particularly being recognized by the, the, uh, the thumb, then and there you can use uh, to unlock your mobile device with your thumb. But the passcode within the, within the system is for, uh, the, the strong version of uh, a PIN, which is the passcode, what they call it. But people did not know that. People still believe the pass. they use PIN. PIN is 128 uh, digits, four digit, 128 bit. Uh, the permutation, if you calculate the 24, and I can figure, easily figure out, you're writing a small mathematical script um, a program, so I can easily figure out how you're going to break into the system and uncover your password, which is the the problem that we had. And importantly, what Apple said is not there in the product. What we are talking about is when we are saying that, what do the nutritious when we buy something off the shelf, eat something, oh, just to hang around with friends, oh, when we wanted to get buy something, we expect something at the back of the des descriptions, uh, they explain something, but which is, which, when it is not there, there, so this is not the right thing. So what, they have done a massive good job, mathematically correct, they have nice designed the architecture, but that hasn't been communicated to the user because you've got the Touch ID. You don't have a system to demonstrate how the Touch ID works to the people. So part of the problem was human. Human are the weakest link in information secret. Even people used to say that I go to Apple store and what they said, hey, put four-digit pin. And how many of your family with people are saying that, can you put four-digit pin? They're particularly precise about four-digit, why not six, why not seven, why not eight? So after doing this, Apple changed their password policies um, and we, even particularly they introduced at the time, now they have changed the passcode totally because understanding this is that might lead to a massive security failure. So we identify the users, the humans, are the, otherwise the architecture is good, but people don't know how the system works. The architectures are so busy with implementing the architecture without taking human elements on board. But when people use it, they don't understand the systems and why my mum can't use the technology, why mom, my grandmum can't use the technology. So complex. We design something which is complex and asking people to interact with the system, which they find it almost impossible to interact with the systems that we design. So this is my client IT, uh, client desktop, not actually laptop. Um, I try to access to my client email address. I try to access to my uh, defense clients, ADFA stand for Australian Defense Force Academy. Um, and I find it, uh, suddenly I just wanted to find out how encrypted my password is. Since I'm a member of Defense, so I'm being treated as a kind of a, I assume that my information will be safe, uh, particularly in a defense space, not from another university or another uh, research organization. So, but when I looked at it and I found it, certificate is well invalid. And who should we be blaming for? And all the information which is being transferred, which could be uh, transferred with, between my client and the email server are not encrypted. So this is the problem, which is not being digitally signed. So we use a third party application. So this is the problem because the certificate is quite outdated. And we are on the defense page. It's a shame to be that we haven't protected ourselves, uh, but we are so busy with protecting other people's Asses. So um, what I'm trying to say is what we wanted to do, dig deeper and try to find out what had, ha what had happened with that. And do programmers understand this? Who should we be blaming for? Because programmers are the ones who are implementing this. And they find it quite, because they're not the security expert and security is not transparent to the user. Because while I'm using this one, nothing will tell me about your information is unsafe. Which all talk about is um, your information will be, you know, the communication will be safe between your computer as well as the server. So I believe in that. But actually that is not happening like that. What is the problem? 
Who should we be blaming for? When I talk to the technical support, they ask me, what should I do? Oh, that's not my job to decide. Okay, so, and that's what we all say, because we all have got, we are busy with other things, and if you try to put somebody else's one, I mean, we don't really want to take other people's blame. So that could run into that situations like that. And also I dig deeper and try to realize that, how the encryption mechanisms that they use, and they use SHA-1. And this is not very, uh, quite, uh, transparent to the end user because one of the problems that we have here is uh, SHA-1 we know that I, we don't know whether it's SHA-1 or SHA-2 uh, it could be SHA-2 it could be SHA-1 SHA-1 has been uh, broken already SHA-1 is the secure hashing algorithm which is used to transfer the information when you transfer the information between you know password and store new data store or whatever the communications everything will be encrypted before you transferring the information Right, but however, Google found out uh, uh, back in 2014 or 13, I can't remember the exact date, and they identified that we can easily break into SHA-1. SHA-1 has been deprecated now. And attackers know this. They know this. So they don't really need to come up with a fancy code to break into the system. If they use SHA-1, it's been broken. The code snippet is there online. I can use them. I can easily break into the system. Because this is not rocket science, it's a, you're using malicious code. And this is what happened in 2015. Um, a Samsung smart fridge hack, what happened with, you have a smart fridge, you have the display in it, which is synchronized by your Google. So the synchronization, so data transformations, would happen between your Google server, email server, as well as your smart fridge display through the SSL, a TLS, Transport Layer Security, or Secure Socket Layer, the predecessor. So what we do is, when you use that, it is digitally signed by the uh, SHA-2. SHA-1 is, but Samsung, you know, Samsung is a, they can afford to have experts in secu security as well as program. They have uh, enough experts, um, expertise within the organizations, but they fail to identify what the programmers, what they did is, instead of using SHA-2, they use SHA-1. SHA-1 is already broken. We don't have to come up with the rocket science to break into the systems, and when people knew that, it is easy. So that's what the Samsung smart, smart fridge hacked. And we did a lot of research in this area to identify how do we protect people where the things have gone wrong and how do we uh, protect people against these kind of attacks. So uh, the funny thing is Malcolm Turnbull in uh, Prime Minister Australia, we were talking about, he was talking about all the apps and the website need to be upgraded to SHA-2 by the 1st of January 2017. Who should we blaming for? Which is on the which was on the news. But the problem is, should we be blaming for the programmers, software engineers, archi IT architects? Oh, penetration testers. They have no idea about what the hell happening here on this space because they know how to run Nmap, Metaspite, all the security techniques, and it isn't anybody can do that. I think uh, because you don't have to have extra skills to do that. And it's running that and identifying how many ports were open enable, how many ports are disabled, you don't have to have a rocket science to do that, you just run the uh, net, uh, network mapping tool and just identify all the information there. It's like writing an audit. But the problem is, when we have these things, who should we be blaming for? And we don't know, software engineers, testers, analysts, architects, uh, or maybe software quality assurance engineers, they don't know what the hell going on on the space, but they assume that, all right, we can blame it to somebody. So that is the problem with the secret. And also, without this functionality, still that could work smoothly. Because people, security is not transparent to the end user, neither to programmers. So this is a huge problem that we are facing today. So we did a lot of work in this space. And got our work in one of the high uh, top software engineering, so security engineering journals. <coughs> so we wrote something about my, my research group. I'm leading the usable security research group uh, in University of New South Wales and Australian Defence Force Academy. So we've got brilliant students uh, and we Im invented, uh, we ran an application to understand people's behaviour programmers behavior because everybody's busy with you know you have heard about thousands tons of words on news medias and everywhere you've been hearing about end users are we need to really protect the end users users are important and uh, humans are the weakest link users are enemies they are stupid they're crazy and all sort of things we are using to on blaming on them but the problem is but we were just thought of rather than trying to make the world better, the end users, what we really wanted to think about who the hell we are designing the system. So we really wanted to focus on the guys, engineers, architects, 
experience of technology assurance engineers. Uh, and uh, the organization perspective, who developed these bloody systems? Uh, who makes this quite worse for people? We really want to identify. I'm not saying, oh, it is not a blame for software engineers. It is a problem with, because we need to be able to identify what are the problems that they're facing. Because they want to develop something fantastic to the outside world. But the problem is they're not security experts. Even small to medium organization, they could afford to have people with technical skills, but they, could, they can't afford to have people with technical skills, security and programming. Those are two different disciplines. When I was a programmer, I was like trying to, I was so busy with getting the function implemented rather than thinking about any other things. So and the people will come back to me and say that, oh, right, you've got to think about out of the box. I don't know what the hell you're talking about out of the box. Which box are you talking about? I have no idea about it. But the problem is, when it comes to these kind of situations, who should we be blaming for? And how do we make it better? But we really wanted to understand their behavior and how that behavior, programming behavior, engineers' programming behavior could lead to a massive security Earlier, we did a bit of study to understand. We evaluated real world programmers to GitHub. Um, we actually sent out 16,470 email, emails on GitHub and asking people to participate because we know that they are the real people. That they, we've got people with four to ten years of experience uh, developing software in Java platforms, and we actually. I wanted to identify the mistakes, the behavioral mistakes that they make that could lead to massive security failure. So we conducted a study. We have looked at four different API in the original study. One is secure socket layer, how they implement the, uh, the uh, secure socket layer transformation of, you know, when you use your browser, browser to uh, your server, whatever the server that you're trying to do, work with, communicate with, TLS, transport layer security or secure socket layer. The other one we looked at, um, a Google Authentication API. The other one we looked at, OWSP or API. The other one we looked at, um, uh, uh, secure hashing algorithm, the one that I'm talking about. So I'm talking particularly today just one thing because I've got other things to just, just, just to talk about. So we've recruited 10 participants, 10 programmers actually, and asked them to spend. They spend with our laboratory based prototype that we have designed actually in the living environment, in the programming environment. We asked them to embed the things. We gave them purposely secure, insecure coding. Uh, ask, we just store um, their password on the text file. Believe it or not, a lot of people still do hard coding their passwords. <laughs> it's a kind of a joke, but I know that still people do that, and they store their password on text file. Raise your hands, those who have used, stole your password at least one time in your life on your code. Raise your hands. Okay. So uh, raise your hands, those who have stored your password on text file. I'm not talking about when it comes to programming, not just a thing. And when you store, write a coding to store your password. So, so this is the problem. And look, we are there to make people's life better. But we are making other people's life I'm not blaming software engineers. I was a programmer and I, was, I didn't know anything about it. But this is the problem that we are leading to. But what we need to find out a way to do that, so that's what I'm going to go. So, and we actually identify, we use a bouncy causal API, uh, application programming interface to implement secure hatching algorithms, and we identify 63 usability issues that could lead to a massive security failure. In each program out of 10, we approximately identify 15 usability issues that could lead to massive security failure. That was a huge problem that we identified with that our work. Where is this going to go? And, and I'm going to talk about a little bit more details about that. And when it comes to the S script, we use actually rather than SHA, we use the, it does the same thing, S script, uh, the Java version, which is quite fancy. And we looked at the literature and it talks about that it is quite solid. We use that method class, and they have a method called to generate the uh, secret hashing algorithms to transfer your communication through the, uh, and store on your data store. When we use that, if you look at the uh, IDE, Integrated Development Environment, whether you use Eclipse or any other IDE, uh, BlueJ, IntelliJ, or whatever, but they have a different version to the, their API documentation. Can we blame to the, the programmers? No. 
this is something wrong with the whole system. This is the problem that we have. And programmers are innocent. They really wanted to make other people's life better. But the problem is that resources that they have provided with are not sufficient for them to do that. They don't really understand. They have three different methods. And if you use incorrect byte values, that depends on the, how strong your password is. And we identify if the programmer uses weak value for the par parameters, the security of the password st st storage will be weak and it will be vulnerable to attacks. And if you use even the sword value, that could lead to a massive dictionary of pre-computed rainbow attacks. We identify that. Sometimes people use string over to byte value because which is quite easy because API says different things. And um, your programming tool will tell different, totally different things. And you don't know what the hell I'm going to do with that, but the beauty thing is security is not transparent to you because when you test it, you don't, you don't, you don't see nothing. So not a problem at all. So this is a problem. And what happened when people use, because string is everybody's fancy thing because you try to reduce a hell of a lot of problems using string values. Those are immutable objects. Unless you explicitly invoke the garbage collector, you know what I'm talking about, uh, the, your, uh, your, your, your data will be re remaining there. And if I'm the attackers, I can access to that information. People are using string values within that parameters. That's what we have been experiencing. So it will be there unless you explicitly invoke the garbage collector. You know, if I'm talking about a bit of Java thing. So that was a huge problem. The attackers could access this information. And also we observed the documentation of Bouncy Castle APIs not being readable to the end user. I'm talking about the users, I mean programmers. So what, what are the things that you've got on the space? It is nothing wrong with programmers. I said to people, I don't blame on programmers or software engineers. The problem would be with they don't have enough resources to do that. And they don't have enough skill set the knowledge to do that. That's the problem that we are having. We observe a few other issues as well. And also I'm working on privacy space as well. So how do we embed better privacy or privacy into the application context that you do? Software engineers are responsible for doing that. Would you give your home address to a stranger if somebody bump into you while you're walking along the road? Of course not. Assume that how many people you give you home address. Assume that I happen to meet you, bump into you on the road, because before giving this talk, um, would you give your home address to, to myself? Raise your hands, those who think you don't. See? But how many of you have shared your geolocation information over the Facebook where the people can find your location within exactly 10, 15 meters? At least once in your lifetime? I see a lot of people lying here. <laughs> yes, I've got a few honest um, hand up. Um, uh, so th this is the problem. This is the problem thing. Because we enable our geolocation over Twitter. Or, um, 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 I'm not sure Twitter, but uh, WhatsApp, Viber, um, kind of things. Who engineer the systems? But when we implement the geolocation information, GPS stuff, using the API, what we are interested in is getting the functionality done. And we said, wow, we got the Google map, we got all the location clearly done, and now it works. And we don't, don't really give a, we don't really think about um, privacy aspect of people, because whereas this opens up the back door for the attackers to you know, access to your system. So this is the fundamental problems that we have. And this guy failed to do that as well because he thought in Cambridge Analytica thing recently happened um, because people are using Facebook developers. Raise your hands, those who have used Facebook developer toolkits in your work. A lot of people. Would you be, honestly tell me, would you be able to use that? Would you ever use this Facebook developer if you can't access to Facebook users? Raise your hands, those who think you would do it. See, that's a fundamental thing. And there is no way that you can benchmark it because I'm going to allow you to use a one gigabyte, two gigabyte. There is no mechanism that we can implement it. This is the problem. Facebook needs to survive. I understand that Google needs to survive. Apple needs to survive. So that doesn't mean that they can't disclose other people's information to somebody through 
some people, like I'm talking about somebody, is the hackers through developers. So let's put it in that way, be more contextualized. So this is the problem. And do, do like organizations like Facebook, do you think that they did, did not know that? No, they know this, but they can't do it. That's against their business model. If that's the case, they have to shut down within 24 hours, I'm pretty sure. Not more than 48, precisely. So talk about this is one of the app that we have in Australia, so Ami Safe Driver app, which helps you, which gives you roadside assistance when you broke down, uh, when you broke, uh, when your car broke down, they will give you all these informations. But the problem is their GPS log will find you, will all, not only reveal, oops, sorry, um, where you travel, but how fast you drive, which route you take, which ATMs you stop at, and what medical clinics you have visited during the last month. So when you go to the toilet, you can't go and tell people, tell your doctor um, that you haven't, you, you, you weren't drunk um, Friday night at XYZ pub, because the doctor can find out all this information uh, from your toilet, because you've got a sensor in the toilet. So that calculates the urine and that goes to the server through the mobile app or IoT device that you're going. You can't tell your doctor about that you haven't drunk. Uh, you haven't been drunk during the last you know, couple of weeks or whatever. You can't lie to people. So the, your previous, previous information will be that that's happening for the sake of good thing, but attack is always interested in leveraging their attack through human manipulation. So privacy and security are not two things. They are quite same. Most of the security breach, privacy breaches, could lead to a massive security failure. So think about Twitter privacy policy. How many, raise your hands, how many of you used, at least read Twitter privacy policy? Well done, no one. Um, how many of you, I can't ask a second question, of course, because how many of you understand what it is? Because privacy policy, we need to read that and we need to understand it, but has it been written in layman term? No. They are developing privacy policies. They talked about that, how, what kind of information they are collecting from you, because it's your information, your privacy, that could lead to a massive security failure. That happens with Uber. Uh, collecting drivers and riders' information, the thousands of thousands of information. So when it comes to here, they are developing these policies, having lawyers protecting themselves mind rather than end users in mind. This is the, the, the fundamental, this is the crazy things that they have done. And think about that. Sometimes you might have received, um, in a, in, if you've been using that, August 2016, uh, WhatsApp password, uh, WhatsApp, Privacy policy has been updated, so they decided to go along with their parental parental company called Facebook. You know that, and in that case, they decided to share all the information that they're going to collect: people's phone numbers, text messages, as well as all the profile informations share with Facebook. They are going to use that for advert advertisements, you know, or advertising campaigns. But have has this been communicated to you properly? We are engineering systems for people. Have we looked at human? And when we even provide them with the updates, look at this, this is my Viber thing. Um, and it says, it asks me to accept and continue before I give the privacy policy. What the hell happening here? What, because they don't really want me to read the privacy policy. Who engineered this? Programmers, engineers, software designers and with the support from architects, massive organizations. So this is a problem. And when I breach the security issues or privacy, so they call me that I'm stupid and I'm crazy and I am like, they treat me as enemy because I, I don't know how to use computers. So what we did, so we, we've actually tried to implement a systematic approach like software development lifecycle and kind of things to uh, embed privacy into uh, 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 software systems. We've got the best industry research award for this, uh, best paper award from one of the top class A uh, industry-oriented conference. This is, this is through the industry track. What we did, <coughs> um, what we did, um, we actually did a little bit of work to understand how programmers, software engineers, 
embed previously into the application that they, 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 they developed and designed and developed. We gave them a task, actual and real laboratory study. We could afford to have them. And we investigated 36 software developers in software design tasks and provided them with instruction to embed previously into the applications that they developed in order to identify their behavioral issues that could lead to a massive security failure. So this is here are the practical issues that we identify. Developers have practical issues when they attempt to embed privacy into the software applications because they have a lot of because they don't know about all the theories. We have privacy engineering methodologies. We have privacy impact assessment. We have um, uh, privacy by design mechanisms, like. Everybody's talking about Agile, but nobody's talking about all these things. They are quite worth as well. But the problem is we ask people to, you know, look at little things and implement it. Because when we find out, you know, just we overlook them. But how do we transform these mechanisms like um, uh, uh, um, privacy by design, privacy impact assessment, fair information practices? They're being designed by the lawyers and privacy specialists privacy advocates and, and top people in, the, in, in, in every government. But the problem is that is not being transparent through the systems what we developed. But there is a huge gap between the two. But then we blame to the programmers or the people who design the system saying that they are crazy. They designed something quite impossible because they are. You know, programmers' job is to get the implementation done, not to look at engineer the systems. And your CEOs, your manager, management, top management is not going to support you to come up with the best security design because they will come and tell you, tap on your shoulder Friday night saying that, oh, look, we're not, if you're not going to get this one, I'm going to kick your ass. That's what you've been experienced that because we have a lot of pressure to hit the deadlines. I worked in the industry. Uh, I had the same experience, and a lot of people come and tell them they don't really want it, and also then they will come and blame you. Uh, you're not creative. Yeah, you can't be creative because you can't work 24 hours a day. That's the thing. And, and we really need to, as organization, architecture, hierarchy, we all need to be able to understand this space. There are so many things uh, that we need to take into consideration when it comes to de developing. And the concept may not work in software development environments. Sometimes one of the problems that we have is, you know, you're t working on a lot of pressure to hit the deadlines. You don't do And also, you don't see privacy or security. It's not transparent. These are the, not the things transparent to you. And if you don't see that, how can you expect the end user to see that as well? So this is a huge problem that you're having today. And so when developers lack knowledge, their personal opinion. So when you don't have knowledge and expertise in this particular space, what would you do is you just go and talk to somebody and get their opinion and go and implement it. That's it. And then you think, all oh, right, I've done it because it works. Anyway, it works without having security or privacy functionalities. So that is the bottom line. And, uh, and also, we have a complex system requirement. And it is very difficult at the architecture level, system analysis and information gathering and system analysis designing. All these phases, it's very difficult to identify where the privacy is going to fit in. Because you really need to pay attention to each and every stage of doing that. How do you do that? This is quite a question. We need to develop, we need to have a solid framework that's what we are implementing at the moment so <laughs> I'm going to move on to a kind of interesting a different thing and fishing in March 2016 John Podesta the chairman of Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign programming campaign so he rec she received uh, he received an email with the subject line of um, uh, someone has your password boom then it greets hi John and um, it says, someone just use your password to try to sign in to a Google account. They provide all the information where somebody else, or perhaps the cyber criminals, access to your password, um, and the time, and the date, and the computer, as well as the location. And also, it says that Google stopped this sign in attempt, and you should change your password immediately to get your password back. Otherwise, boom. And they provided you with a link. The link is coming from Bitly. Think about the sort of situations like Bitly. How many of you have used Bitly? Bitly is, is that provides you URL shortening service because in Twitter you can only use 140 characters to enter into that. But when you use 
longer version of the URL, you can't do it, you need to shrink it. That provides this. Attackers use these techniques to strengthen, strength, uh, shorten their URL and mimic their URL because the browsers would not identify that. This is being designed, basically, for the good purpose, but attackers use that for mimicking things, you know, making, mockering things up. So, I'll ask a question, and you're quite familiar with phishing. I'm pretty sure that you have heard of phishing. Some of you have been phished. And so, have you ever tried to fool somebody through technology? Maybe phishing for the money, or maybe just to have fun of it? Raise your hands. Have you ever been victimized for phishing attacks? Financially, oh, it could be just to have a fun. No? Well, well done. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. Raise your hands, those who still think that you haven't fooled anybody. Oh, you haven't been victimized for any any sort of this kind of maybe not for the financial gain, maybe social gain, or have a fun, maybe from your mum or dad or somebody else. Raise your hands. Not. I'm so surprised. Oh wow, well done. I, I, I by myself, I've I've been fooled. Uh, that's what I'm here. Um, right and. Uh, so we, a bit of Carnegie Mellon University, a bunch of guys, they identified, they wanted to identify how, um, who falls for fishing. And they identified female, women are more susceptible than men for fishing. And also they said uh, the people age range between 18 to 25 are the most uh, vulnerable generation for phishing attacks because they use a lot of technology. So they use a lot of mobile technology. They try to connect to internet all the time, kind of things like that. So, um, and also we did a lot of work in this area to identify how to be better design education to enhance people's phishing threat avoidance behavior. So we actually come up with that uh, in this space. Uh, we developed a gamified approach to protect people against these attacks. So the interesting bit about the game is we've done a lot of work to understand people's mental model. So we were talking about all the attacks. We were talking about all the problems. Now, I'm going to talk about here the solutions that we wanted to do, but one problem, one particular solution that we wanted to, uh, to come up with. And here, what we do is when we design education, it's like, look, when I was small, my father, I've been asked to go and, you know, go and get education. But they don't tell me about how do we do I get the education. And I, I find it quite uh, very depressing and not interested in the way that I learn things. But why? Because if you dig deeper and realize you're not being uh, the intro, the, why high school, math, why people don't like high school mathematics? They're not being interested in the design. For people, you don't. People who fail it, I don't think they're stupid and crazy. I think they are the genius because they identified this is anyway shit because the education is it, it sucks. So I don't blame them, honestly speaking. I do agree with pretty much what has been said in the morning for a couple of sessions, and I think on that basis we wanted to identify how people, their mental models, how their threat avoidance behavior, because we wanted to design technology for people. So how do we do that? We need to take the people's mental models on board when it comes to designing and developing technology. What we did, we tried to investigate what factors that could contribute, could influence to enhance phishing threat avoidance behavior. So we identify those elements. Once we identify those elements, we develop the storyboard with with a kind of a nice story which exaggerate things in a real life. And then we want to transform people's mental model into a gamified app that teaches people how to protect themselves against phishing attack. Because this is a mental model we find it. Because perceived threat, you should feel a threat before you take an action against that. You should feel like that is influenced by perceived severity and susceptibility. If it has happened, if a phishing, I've been fished off, and then I feel like, okay, I need to find out a precaution for this. But if otherwise, I might not find it. Safeguard effectiveness, I should believe in having anti-phishing tools, or anti-phishing well, anti education in order to protect myself against these attacks. 
What happened, once we identified those elements, I wanted to, we wanted to find a way to incorporate this one into a gamified solution. Well, we did. So this is a small fish and big fish who lives in a big pond. Small fish, oh, the worms are randomly generated. Uh, I, each worm is assigned either with good URLs, phishing attacks, oh, so the, the legitimate one, or the bad URLs, the phishing attacks. So, um, so your job is to identify which one is the best. Right, so URLs are one of the ways, the, the, the main ways to identify whether or not it is a phishing attack. So what we did, and if you're not sure, you can go and find out, ask the fish big teacher, the, the big fish, so he will provide you some bit of consultation how to identify uh, whether or not it is a good URL. So what we did, every time when you get the, uh, the, the right thing, the score will get incremented by one, and then you get at the end of the day, once you qualify some batch. So what we want to identify, this threat model, randomly generated worms are either assigned with that. So you perceive threat, you see different URLs. And if you hit on the wrong thing, and you see you lost a life, susceptibility and severity, if that particular thing happens, you lost your life. Or um, you can't score. So that is the thing. And all likewise, we incorporated these things. And we did a pretest and post test. Before playing the game, we recruited participants and asking them to do a test. And after playing the game, we asked them to another test. So then we tried to understand how the awareness has been increased. And also we wanted to identify their mental models. While they're interacting with the game, we collected what their thought process, what kind of strategies that they have occupied to differentiate phishing attempts from legitimate ones. And we try to understand how that reflects on the framework. Their mental models we identified. This is kind of a reverse engineering things with a bit of psychology we understood. So here are the pre-test uh, uh, websites we have shown them. And, uh, uh, and interestingly, we identify that awareness has been increased by 28%. And also we identify that their mental model reflects on the, their psychological behavior. So the problem then I said to myself, and look, we have been educating people throughout the generation. And my question is, education, training, professionalism, they do not reflect on the real world behavior. because. You know having anti-phishing tools installed on your computer will protect you. You know having uh, antivirus education will help you to protect your computer. You know how to identify phishing attacks, was this, but the problem is that does not reflect on reality. Because while you're walking along the road, you get a text message or you get a Facebook request saying that um, you don't want to accept it, but you've got a fat finger. You just tap on it. Instead of rejecting that, you accept it. We can't go back and do that. There, there are kind of limitations to that. In that case, there are emotional things into it. You just said that, okay, I'll give it a go, I don't care. So that is the problem, the human element. So your education does not always reflect on actual behavior. So what we wanted to identify in the Australian Center for Cybersecurity, where I work currently, we really wanted to n understand now uh, to what is the best solution that we can give. Because educate, everybody's talking about when the technology doesn't work, okay, we should educate people. But nobody's talking about how do we better educate people. Even if you'd find a way to better educate people, that does not reflect on their actual behavior. Right, so in a two minutes, I'm going to wrap up everything. Thank you. And um, I can talk all day. Um, so what happened, we actually want to ask people to play the game, interact with the game. While they are interacting with the game, we collect their behavior, what kind of strategies that they occupy to differentiate phishing attempts from a legitimate ones. And once we collect their information, we analyze and develop a threat model, understanding how the attackers could leverage their attacks through human manipulation. Because Attackers are interested in people's behavior, not the technology. Technology is so solid and it's been nicely built up and we don't have to worry about it, but they are interested in that. We can't collect people's behavior, it's quite difficult, but we use a gamified approach to actually collect people's strategies, their behavioral things, how they differentiate phishing attacks from a legitimate one. But collecting that information, we develop a threat model understanding how the attackers could leverage their attacks through human manipulations. So in this space, what we are going to do next is 
um, we then we can use this threat model to advise the organization, hey, look, if you really want this one and we can find out how weak your employees are and how do we strengthen the weakest link, we can develop procedures, cybersecurity policies, privacy policies, we can identify what kind of training you need within your organization, we can identify uh, what sort of technical tools you need, technical countermeasures, non-technical countermeasures, human countermeasures, and organizational countermeasures, we can collect all this information to back them up. That is the one that this is leading this project. So I'm actually in charge of all these projects that I've been talking about. And if you're interested in any of them, I'm more than happy to talk about it. And also we are recruiting PhD students if you've got a first class honors degree. That's a bit of marketing here. And uh, I'll take this opportunity, uh, you know, perhaps uh, take the question if I have time or otherwise um, uh, I'll say thank you very much. The certificate issue that you showed uh, mm -hmm. about your defense academy, um, uh, that the algorithm, I think, uh, they asked, uh, it's incorrect. Um, so that SHA-1 uh, and SHA-2 both are still valid uh, for the certificate fingerprints. Um, so if you check the Google certificate or any other certificate, both are still valid. Yeah. So what is not valid is actually the signatures hashing algorithm, uh, which is uh, different from yeah. that. Yeah. What, I, what my point here is when you use that, uh, the, if you look at that SHA-1, because you don't know when you developed it, you know, we don't know how it's been encrypted. It is not transparent to the end user. Because even if it is SHA-2, I understand that uh, that shows a SHA-1 in the, the bottom line that you were talking about. That's true. But the problem is that is kind of misleading the user Mis misleading the programmer because he, he doesn't know, even assume that you're working in the organization and you would just wonder, you found a wonderful job and you just want to leave in the next day. And I'm the one who's going to take care of the rest of the, the work. And then you implement it. I don't know which, whether, whether or not you've used char 1 or char 2 because it doesn't show me that. If you look at the last one, it could have been used char 1 or char 2 but we don't know. The interface, it does not reflect. It doesn't give us what it is. Does that make sense? Any any follow-up questions or anything? Yeah, um, that's that's a whole point that we identify because there is no way of testing security because we don't know. Is there a way that we can just rather than dig in, uh, dig into the code level, uh, we can't find out that from the interface level and even the configuration is incorrect. So that was my whole point. Yeah, I think. A, from if you're talking about this is a massive thing, from the user's perspective, organization's perspective, from software developer's perspective, which one do you want me to answer? I have the answer for all of them. Drawing the line. Okay, so from the software developer's perspective, um, assume that whatever the things that they use, we need to make that better for them. Because they are not the security expert. That's what we are investigating, because we can't provide with a solution saying that, hey, use the XYZ things, use PQR thing, because unless you understand uh, the space. Because we really want to identify what are the problems that they're facing, what are the behavioral issues that they have and then provide the solutions. We are developing a systematic approach, helping software developers to embed pre, uh, security, particularly security APIs into the application. Because problem with the security API, we have, because Facebook, Google, Apple, and all the organizations, they can afford to have <laughs> um, software engineers with security experts, expertise. But small to medium organizations, sometimes you do off, you know, kind of, a, sole companies like individuals that develop their systems and sell them. And they are not security experts. In that case, how do we, we need to have a framework. We need to have a systematic approach for helping them and helping them to implement security, particular security APIs into the application. So when we provide them, not only that, but also we need to have a framework to test it. We can't ask software quality assurance engineers to test security because they have no idea about how the security mechanism works. It is quite unfair to ask them. And when there is a breach, we blame on them. This is so 
pathetic, I do believe. So that's why we need a lot of research in this area, helping uh, people to come up with a framework. Oh, because we have a software development life cycle. We, have, we talk about agile, we talk about extreme programming, we talk about a lot of things, Scrum or X, Y, Z things. And why don't we talk about these things? Because nobody has talked about it in previously, because previous is important. You are dealing with people's information, you are dealing with people's life. And when it comes to that, humans, are important because other people are making money out of your information, your privacy. They are selling your privacy to somebody else for, for money, which is not something we should appreciate. So the problem is, in a software developer's perspective, we really need to help them. They need more resources. That's what we really understood. And end user's perspective, whatever the system that we design, we need to be able to humanly design the system. It is not just designing another XYZ system, so stock control, inventory control, even the small things, not just designing something. We really need to see their interactions. I like the way Dave talked about in this, this morning session, so even after the peak to talk about it. We need to have empirical evidence. And I'm quite glad people understand industry. And because I'm working with Google and Facebook and I worked with HP, we understood, they are really understood understood about the importance of the research, but some organizations, they can't afford to have that uh, kind of thing. So that's why they have all sorts of problems, because they develop systems and they just, you know, deploy the system at customer side and they test the uh, uh, use of quality assurance engineers to test it, but they are testing integrated testing, alpha testing, beta testing, uh, functional testing, all those little, little testing. But the problem is human testing, nobody's going to do that. And that could lead to a massive security failure. You can't fix it again if there is a security failure. So whatever the system which we design, we need to take human element into considerations when it comes to design and develop technology. And also we need to find a better way of educating people. How do we better educate people? How do we better uh, train people? We are not just training for the sake of it. We really need to identify what are the weaknesses, what are the problems that they have, and then design, which is unique to the organization, to organization. Because sometimes if you have the same bank, and I've talked to the bank, and I'll be, I'm, I'm with, the, with their research team, so NEZ has got different strategy to um, uh, NAP, North Stra National Australia Bank. They have totally different, but they looks, the business looks the same. But this is a fundamental problem that we have. And we are, we are providing a solution, assuming that all of them would find it, because they use a different mechanism, they use different ways of developing their systems, they are developing their business, even manual systems. So that is the huge problem. And this is quite a complex issue that we've got to think about as a software engineering mechanism, what I call software security engineering. Okay. The problem is not the technology, the problem is the human who are using the systems. When you design the architecture, you need to test it with people in a very solid way. Otherwise, that would ruin the whole aspect. Because the problem is, when, you, when they got the touch IT, because people thought, OK, I can still use, it works with four-digit pin. But the problem is, this is not when they invented the architecture. This is not what they have been expected uh, people to use. And that's not been addressed in the architecture. What they have done, they have done a fantastic job in security architecture, designing of the touch ID things, but that, that did not communicate to the end user. That was a problem that they faced. So the, it is not the coding, I understand. We use a penetration testing. If you really wanted to identify how many ports enable, how many, that's what I said. People are so busy with developing penetration testing tools, They're using you know, Nmap and Wildshark and all sort of things. But the problem is that tells you about system level vulnerability. But the problem is attackers are not interested in that bit. Attackers are interested in human vulnerability. They can easily break into the system. So that is the problem. And we need to be worried about, we need to get ourselves busy of implementing human firewalls rather than technical firewalls. Because humans are the weakest link in information security from the attacker's perspective. Yeah, SHA-1, the digitally, yeah. And so th those are the, I mean, when it comes to security algorithms, but the problem is, the interesting bit that we found, I'm, I'm sure, I'm not sure, the time is quite crucial. Interesting thing we found is, a lot of programmers, what they do is they just go and Google it. And you're quite familiar with the Stack Overflow, what I'm talking about, right? And a lot of the time, I find it, 
people who criticize a lot the Google, you know, they have an algorithm, service engine uh, optimization, search engine, I'm sorry, search engine optimization. So you get the most hit one at the top. And then people who have a lot of bugs that will come up all the way. And people are, because as a programmer, what I do is normally when I do programming, I just copy and paste and plug it into the, you know, put into the my, my, my code sniff it and it works. Because and in it, when it comes to security, I mean other functions, I know actually how it works, but in security I don't know. That's the problem with that we have SHA one. It's when you, even when you look at the configuration setup, it says SHA one. I don't know whether or not it has been SHA two or SHA one. I don't I have no idea about it. There is no way to test it unless I just dig deep and find out how the code how how, how we have implemented the code, which is not reflected to the engineers. Oh, the software quality assurance engineers. We can't blame on them. We can't, we can't expect them to do that. So this is the main problem. And I think, um, so we might need to work a lot of research in this space. And if you're really interested in, and if you've got a first class NS degree and pl help um, planning to move to Australia, so uh, feel free to drop an email. So we only, the university has got a requirement to have a first class degree. So uh, even though we don't believe. So I'll shut up and thank you very much for listening to the boring talk. <laughs>